Most of us were at the, uh, the Thanksgiving dinner last night. There are a lot of people talk about that. And, uh, Joanne really uh, did a lot of that work. A lot of Thank you to everybody that set things up and took things down. And there are a lot of visitors there, which was great. A lot of uh, extended family uh, coming along. And uh, so it was, it was nice to walk into the room and see, you know, some faces that we hadn't seen in a while or, or didn't recognize. That was just a really cool time. And I my favorite part, you know, from a physical standpoint, was walking in and then starting to go down the stairs and just smelling Thanksgiving. Oh, oh, that's great. Uh, all right, well, we're going to focus on some songs about love this morning. So if we could stand up and turn to number 323. understand your word 
and we can put it down deep into our hearts so that it comes out through action throughout our lives. We just thank you that everything we have is, is from you, and we pray that we will live lives of gratitude and praise in response to you. Father, I love you, and uh, we just are thankful for uh, the ability to be here on this day. Um, and as we are here gathered together, uh, we thank you for our country and for the freedom that we have, Lord. Uh, as we think about that freedom, uh, we know that it did not come free. That it, uh, it was very costly, it cost many lives. So, Father, we thank you for those men and women uh, who have sacrificed their lives. And thank you for the men and women uh, who are sacrificing at this moment, both in our country and around the world, uh, to serve and protect us, Lord. Um, and as we go forward, we pray that our church, uh, whether our country uh, remains to stand as one nation under God, our church will always stand under your will, Lord, um, no matter what it costs. And Father, um, we thank you for uh, the men and women who have given their lives for your sake. And uh, we go miss if we didn't uh, remember that, to remember the price that we paid, Lord. Um, and so, uh, through this season, uh, let us not remember, uh, not forget. Um, those that are, are not home, and those that are um, not able to be with their loved ones. Let's not um, take it for granted what we have here for this country and even the freedom that we have for us. Father, we pray for our leaders. Uh, be with them and guide them. We know that you have a place in where uh, you will, and that nothing goes uh, without your sovereign guidance. So we love you and thank you in your name. Amen. Amen. You can have a seat, and uh, during the announcements and whatnot, be thinking about uh, some testimonies that you might have uh, in a few minutes. All right, thank you. Well, again, let me just say thank you for such a great night last night. Uh, Mickey and Roger and Joanne did a great job planning, and then everybody else chipping in, bringing food, and, and helping uh, set up and clean up. But more importantly, all of you who came and brought people with you, uh, we had around 100 people last night, and we just had a full house downstairs, and it was fantastic. So we just praise the Lord for that. Um, and then also we want to praise the Lord for the fact that the siding project is finished. 5.30 Friday night, we're done. And uh, we do have just a couple tiny little electrical hookups and a few little things have to get done, but... Uh, uh, we're just, just praise the Lord for a, a good job well done there with uh, Ted and Janelle and uh, they packed up yesterday morning and headed back home to Fairhaven and uh, he had about three weeks worth of work to do before Thanksgiving. It works about good for him. He works six days a week year round. But anyways, uh, so just praise the Lord for a good work done there. Um, and then uh, we just also want to remind you, uh, I think we're out of the quote down verses but uh, that means that's good news. That means there, uh, many people have taken a copy of these verses, and we would encourage you to start memorizing them. We won't actually have any uh, of our fun competition until January, but we'd encourage you to get a copy, and I will have more out there next week, uh, and, and start memorizing these verses. Maybe you can only memorize two or three in the next couple months, but that would be better than zero, right? Hide the Word of God in your heart. So uh, we encourage you to, if you have a copy, which many of you do, uh, keep working on those, all right? Uh, this afternoon, we're going to have, it says in our bulletin, a bag lunch. We're not. We had so much turkey and potatoes and whatnot left over last night. Uh, we've got a feast downstairs for lunch again. So we encourage you to stay for lunch, and then uh, we're going to have our afternoon service, and that will be right downstairs also. Uh, so uh, plan on staying. And we will also, uh, in the afternoon service, have a brief, te uh, not testimony, we can have those in a few minutes, brief business meeting uh, to approve some recommendations from our missions committee concerning some new missionaries we're going to take on, uh, supporting. Uh, so that's this week. Next week, Sunday school at 9.45, church at 11, Sunday evening service is at 6. And I just want to remind you about Sunday school. We encourage you to come every Sunday, 9.45, if it's not part of your normal have it, make it a part, uh, at least in our adult class. Uh, we have a great time. Um, we have the team teaching right now by Justin and Mark. Uh, but then in addition to the, uh, the good counsel from our teachers, we also get the, the insights of Bill Long, and, and, uh, and then we get good questions from people. 
Claire always comes up with some good questions, instigates some great discussion. And, and anyways, we have good time studying the Word of God. So we encourage you to join us at Sunday school. We have classes for all ages, but usually we didn't for our teens this morning. But normally we have classes for all ages, so come for that. Joel, speaking of which. Parents and teens, when you're here at 9.42 on Sunday morning for your class next quarter, I expect you to have your teens here as well. We're going to be talking about what God expects out of our teens for the future, kind of help guiding them in that direction. Uh, I will be teaching. So when you're here for Josh and Jeffrey's class or Nancy Butel's, I do expect your teens here. And by, that's like 9.42, 9.43. Perfect. Thank you. Excellent. <laughs> yes, we, we get kind of lazy and get later and later, but uh, let's get, try to get back at 9.45. Joan. Pastor, um, Missy asked me to announce there's a 4 o'clock rehearsal next Saturday for those who have a speaking part in the Christmas play. Okay. It's going to be a little six-act play, and your younger children are just going to be singing in between the acts. Okay. But if you've got a speaking part, 4 o'clock on Saturday, and there might be another one like following church service on Sunday. Okay, 4 o'clock Saturday. Great. Linda. Um, the revised church directory is out on the table, and I plan on printing out copies for everybody in December. So um, check it now and make sure all your information is correct so that people aren't coming to me afterward and after it's all printed and I've printed multiple copies and then saying, oh, this wasn't right or that wasn't right. Well, check it now. And if you want your... Um, uh, contact information in there and it's not there already, just write on the back of it, you know, what your contact information is and I'll make sure it gets included. Excellent. Good, good. Upgrading our directory. All right. Ushers come and receive our Lord's tithes and offerings, please. <laughs> okay. Justin, would you ask God's blessing on our offerings? Mm -hmm. Heavenly Father, it's a beautiful day to be here. I just want to thank you for our freedom to be here, Lord, it's, as provided by those who serve our this country, Lord. And just pray for all of those who are out there serving and abroad. Uh, we thank you them for their service, Lord, uh, whether it's in the past or uh, currently serving, Lord. Uh, we thank you for them. <coughs> just pray for these tithes and offerings that they be put forward. For your use in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.
uh, some time for some testimonies. And uh, I just kind of nominally said, you know, do them about love, but it, it could be about anything, really, that you feel compelled to share. So, anybody have any testimonies? Anything encouraging? Yeah. Brought the whole crew. You had a whole table. Excellent. So I'll hand over here. It's really not a testimony, but it's more of a thankfulness. I really do want to thank Paul a little bit. And, and it's, I wish I was hoping Ted would be here because that was a big project. Mm -hmm. And I know the stone work that I picked out was not the mm -hmm. most work friendly uh, stuff to work with and I appreciate those guys doing it because it was something I really was looking forward to seeing done on the church and uh, I appreciate all the men that came I know Pastor put in a lot of hours and some others and I, we are thankful for that and I'm thankful for a lot of the people that do little jobs behind the scenes Mark has been a great help to me taking care of a lot of things and being here when I'm at work and can't meet people here in church uh, John Wesley and his son have done a lot of little things and other people, the ladies who paint the front of the church here. And I'm very thankful for that. And we can always use more help. So there's never enough help when it comes to taking care of the church. And now that the church outside is beautiful, uh, let's take care of it. Be conscious when we're mowing and things like that. Um, I have asked John, there's a lot of nails still laying around and we got to get picked up these more springtime so that the more don't hit it for the same trees and I'm just thankful for the men and women that do help take care of the church. So. Thank you. We're thankful for you with uh, the leadership of uh, the things going and recruiting and all that. And the others. Yeah. Love has a special way within itself. And um, Last night it really showed itself by the people who uh, came. Um, not only the fellowship was just wonderful, but the food and the special touch of love that went into uh, all the different dishes. Uh, uh, with each taste I could almost uh, feel the love. And I'm sure everyone that was there, uh, those that uh, behind the scenes put in so much extra effort that maybe nobody noticed. Uh, a special thanks to them uh, for not only their work, but the love that they put into it. And uh, the dinner was just great. If, uh, if you weren't there last night, you missed it, it was wonderful. A couple weeks ago, we had the opportunity to go down to Pennsylvania to my sister's church, and my uncle, um, he was one of my dad's best friends, was down there with his wife and uh, his niece as well. And um, those of you who came to my dad's funeral, he was one of the guys that I kind of called out uh, quite aggressively when I was giving a testimony. And um, we prayed for a long time that dad's uh, death and his funeral would be a tool to witness to his family, and it's continued on. And uh, the pastor down in Pennsylvania was talking, really preaching from the first chapter in Acts, and my uncle downloaded the Bible for the first time on his phone and read through half the book of Acts, and he was just blown away that that stuff was in the Bible. So um, it was just a real blessing to talk with him and to answer questions with him afterwards. So please continue to pray for them, but uh, it's just a, a big answer to prayer three or four plus years in the making now. Okay. I'm going to thank the this church. Um, I'm going to school up in the area, and it's nice that I can come here. It feels just like home. You've all been very welcoming. Thank you so much. Um, recently, the um, uh, plant manager at my work is going to be retiring. He's a guy I've known since I was a teenager, got me into what I do. And, uh, he's going to be retiring, and we were all kind of nervous about who we're going to be getting. Uh, we finally got to meet the new guy, um, and uh, it's pretty obvious at my desk that uh, 
a soldier of Christ, and uh, I got all kinds of verses above my desk and all kinds of stuff. And he came over and he put his arm around me and he says, is this all your stuff right here? I said, yes, sir, it is. And he said, well, I'd like to let you know that I, too, uh, believe that my Lord and Savior is Jesus Christ. So that it's uh, good to know that I'm finally not alone at work anymore. And that the guy that's going to be replacing him, uh, the guy that's like a dad to me is a uh, fellow brother in Christ. So it's pretty good. Thank God for that. I'm thankful that uh, Nate Hamill's back from uh, being gone a few months. We got in a little workout the other day and just about killed us both. But uh, <laughs> well, we survived. It's nice to have you back. You're gone for a good, good few months, right? Four months. <coughs> Training was good? Yep. Any other testimonies? I'm just thankful for my church family. And for those of you who have been praying for my husband, this evening yesterday, and that meant everything. And one day he's going to be sitting here with me. So I appreciate your prayer for that salvation. Amen. Amen. Justin. I also want to say thank you to the church family, too, for making my grandma feel very well. And this was only her second time here in about, maybe about eight, ten years. I know she came here for my baptism, but uh, that was quite a few years ago. I can't believe how much time has passed, but nevertheless, I am so thankful to this church family for putting on such a great show and a, a, a great dinner. Uh, a great time was had by all, so, uh, you know, this is, I, my grandma was a little surprised at how far that I drive, and I, I kind of told her that Grandma, I says, if you understood anything about how I feel about this church, I says, for me, it's so worth the trip. I drive a half an hour every day just to get here, but I don't care. I love it. It's a beautiful drive, but I love coming here. So it, it, it wouldn't be any other way. So thank you to the church. Thank you very much. Joel, we'll do one more. Just one more. I'll try not to be long. Growing up in a past month, I didn't see a lot of things in 19, so, and, um, Quick, a couple of those things we're really thankful for. One are deacons. Um, we don't see them often, but they really do a great job. I'm really thankful for them. Um, two other people, quick. Grant DeRue does so much. Um, being a Sunday school teacher, I really appreciate um, him doing all that stuff. Uh, and thirdly is Bill Long, just for being Bill, uh, the example. Um, and uh, that he is, and also just uh, testing. I don't know. Uh, if you don't get a chance to talk to him, seek him out, hunt him down. Uh, he will push you. So I'm very thankful for all of you. But just uh, quickly for those people that you don't know, they do a lot. And so it's very nice. Okay, one more. We'll sing our last song. Um, I'm just thankful for what's new in my life. After 16 months of being single, I have a new gentleman in my life. And I had an extra Bible that I gave him. Not thinking that he would read it, but I gave it to him as a gift. And he's starting to read it. So I just pray that God, you know, presses on his heart, like how to understand it, and he's been asking questions about it. So maybe one day we'll be in here. All right. Well, how about we all stand up and we'll sing uh, one more song. Remember, in between the verses, there's a little uh, ditty there. We'll make it through together. How deep the Father's love for us.
dismiss our children for children's church. <coughs> Revelation chapter 21 in your Bibles, please. Revelation 21. Well, hell's going to have to wait. Because... <laughs> We're going to go one more sermon on this new heaven and new earth. Uh, Revelation chapter 21. And next week we will get to that study. Terrible. Revelation chapter 21. Notice verse 1. Now I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first, first earth had passed away. Also, there was no more sea. Now, we'd looked at the, uh, really, heaven, our eternal destiny, the last couple weeks. But I wanted to come back to this new heaven and new earth, get a little bit better of idea of what this is going to be like. Uh, it is new. It is a transformed old earth. It's not an entirely new earth. It's the transformed old earth. It's just that it's been transformed and changed so much in its order, in its appearance, and its function, everything's new about it. And so it's therefore called a new heaven and a new earth. We know that the earth, the old earth, is going to be renovated by fire. We're going to look at that in a few minutes uh, in, in 2 Peter. Uh, but, but there is going to be such a a global fire, a conflagration, such that it is going to affect not only Earth, but the whole atmosphere. I don't know, maybe even uh, all the oxygen is going to be burned up by this immense fire. Anyways, it's going to destroy the old atmosphere as well as the Earth, and uh, we will have a new heaven and a new Earth. Chronologically, when does this take place? Well, uh, we're in the church age right now. It's been going on for about 2,000 years since the cross of Christ. Uh, the next thing on the prophetic calendar, as far as God is concerned, is the rapture of the church. I believe the Lord Jesus Christ will descend and snatch away the New Testament church, the true believers. We will be caught up together with Him and them, a glorified saints, in the air, it says. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. On earth, following that, there will be seven years of tribulation period. And uh, during that time, God is going to uh, commence his, uh, er, well, his program with Israel sort of ceased for a while. But that's going to begin again in the tribulation period. And uh, there's going to be tremendous judgments. And these judgments are going to be on Israel as well as the unbelieving world. And so God has got a twofold purpose here during the seven years tribulation period. Terrible judgments on the earth. Uh, experiencing the pouring out of the wrath of God. At the end of that seven year tribulation period, uh, many, many of God's people, the Jews, though there will be Gentiles as well, but primarily the Jews, uh, as a nation there will be a great revival and they will cry out um, in repentance to God and God will come and save His people. And He will come again. It's called the second advent or the second coming of Christ. It's when He actually comes to earth for the second time. And uh, at that time, Christ will return. There will be great cataclysmic events. Although I say there, there's some cataclysmic events going on in the tribulation too. These uh, earthquakes and then the heavens and the stars and stuff throughout the tribulation. But then uh, uh, the coming of our Lord Jesus, the second advent, and He will set up His kingdom and will reign. And, and His reign will actually last forever. There's a thousand years. At the end of that thousand years though, Satan will be... Uh, uh, loosed and then destroyed, and then you have the great white throne judgment at the end of that thousand year period. In fact, if you look in chapter 20 in your Bibles, um, verse 7, chapter 20, verse 7, now when the thousand years have expired, Satan will be released from his prison, go out to deceive, and of course then there will be a great destruction. And then uh, verse 10, the devil who deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast, the false prophet are. They will be tormented day and night forever and ever. Goodbye forever to Satan and his hosts. And, uh, and additionally then, you have verse 11, the great white throne judgment. And him who sat on it from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away. 
Uh, in other words, they cowered, they shunned, they, uh, they, they, they stood aloof in fear. Uh, there was found no place for them, the dead, unbelievers, small, great, standing before God, and they would be judged. Uh, verse 14, death and Hades were cast into the lake of fire. This was the second death. And anyone, and I say everyone, not found written in the book of life, was cast into the lake of fire. There were the devil and the false prophets, forever tormented, done. And then we have eternity beginning. And it's at that point, after the great white throne judgment, that we have this new heaven and new earth that we read about in chapter 21. And so that's just a little of the chronology. When this new heaven and earth comes is right there after the great white throne judgment, the final judgment on Satan, the angels, and all unbelievers cast into the lake of fire forever. <coughs> it says the first heaven and the first earth have passed away. In what sense did they pass away? Uh, and, and some people read that and think that they have just totally been annihilated, disappeared, gone for good. Uh, I don't believe that's what the word means. I think that they have passed away in the sense that they have been transformed into something brand new. It's still the old earth, but now it's been <coughs> renovated, reconstituted, transformed, changed, so that it's all new. Amen. And it's going to be a glorious new heaven and new earth, but it's passed away. Uh, down in verse 4... This new order that God makes in the old earth, He says God's going to wipe away every tear from their eye. In Revelation 21, verse 4, God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There shall be no more death, sorrow, or crying. No more pain. For the former things have passed away. The former things, the former way of life, the former order of this universe is gone and done. This whole earth now that we live in presently is conditioned upon, is influenced, is based upon sin, really. Sin and the curse pervades everything. That's why everything deteriorates, grows old. That's why war, crime, everything is based because of the sin and because of the curse. Well, all that's going to be done away with. We're going to have a new heaven and new earth, and there will be no curse, there will be no sin. It's going to be a purified, cleansed, perfect earth, Sort of like if we go back to Genesis chapter 1 before sin entered, the, the garden of paradise. But I believe it's even going to be better because it's going to be that glorious garden of Eden. Um, 102 <laughs> version. Uh, that's fit and will be for eternity sinless and perfect. And so it's going to be great. So, so the old heaven and earth passed away. Uh, it has been changed. It's different. It's renovated. And uh, it's kind of like what it says about you and I in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Put a bookmark in Revelation 21. But go to 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 17. You and I also are new, aren't we? Well, if you've been born again, if you're one of God's children, you've been made new. It says this in 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Interesting, isn't it neat that he uses the same, the same words? We're a new creation, a new creature. Well, actually, I'm the same old me, except I've been transformed. I've been made new. I've got a new heart, a new soul, a new spirit. God has given me a new nature. He's given me a new name. He's given me a new father. I'm no longer of your father, the devil. I'm... I'm a child of God. I have a new family. I have new goals. I have new ambitions. I have new purpose for living. I have new affections. I have new brothers and sisters. Everything is new. My whole order of life, whereas I once was dominated by sin. Sin was my master, Romans chapter 6. And I lived for sin and I obeyed sin. Now I no longer obey sin. I rather obey the Lord God. That doesn't mean I don't sin, but my chief goal and my master is the Lord Jesus. So everything's been new, transformed. I'm a new creation, it says. And old things have passed away. The old man, what I used to be, how I used to think, my own my old values and old <coughs> me has been transformed into the new. <laughs> and so I wasn't annihilated, was I, when I was saved? I just became different. New. 
Uh, if you go over to Ephesians chapter 4, Paul talks about it again in Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 24. He says, And that you put on the new man, which was created according to God in true righteousness and holiness. Yeah, this new man uh, that we are in Christ as a child of God, this new man created according to God in true righteousness and holiness. That wasn't the old man that we once were. The new man that we are in Christ Jesus as a child of God is one in which we are pursuing righteousness and holiness. Remember, we used to be slaves of sin in Romans chapter 6. And we obeyed sin. Now we have a heavenly, holy Father, the law of God that, that is our desire to obey. And so we, we put on this new man, created according to God, righteousness and holiness. I go over to chapter 2 of Ephesians. Chapter 2 of Ephesians. And uh, this great passage in verses 8 through 10, because it says here, by grace you have been saved through faith. It wasn't of yourselves, it's the gift of God. Not of works, lest anyone should boast. Notice verse 10. We are His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works. We are a new creation. God has created us new. And you notice it? For good works. <clears throat> no longer are we living for the old things and the old ambitions of no, God has recreated us in His image, in holiness and righteousness, and uh, He's recreated us for good works. So, so when we're saved, a great transformation takes place. It's not just, well, I've decided to become a Christian. Or it's not just, well, I said a prayer, and that's the difference between me and someone else. It's not, well, I decided to join this church, and, uh, and now I, I go to that church. That's not what makes a Christian. A Christian is somebody who's been transformed supernaturally, miraculously, by God. His whole nature has been changed to something new and different. And that's why a few weeks ago we were talking about people who just profess to be Christians, but their faith isn't genuine, they're phonies. Because it doesn't, doesn't make a difference in their life, it doesn't transform them. This is how we can tell if a person is truly a true Christian or not. If they're really a true Christian, they will be a new person. They will be transformed. They will produce good works in their life. They'll produce righteousness and holiness. There's a change. And people can see that. I like what the old country preacher said. If you is what you was, you ain't. In other words, if you have not been transformed into a new creation, if old things, your old way of life, your old habits and old desires and old loves, ambitions, if they haven't given away to the new righteousness and holiness in Christ Jesus, if, that's, if that change is not transpired, then you're not a Christian. I don't care what you say. God's Word says there will be a change. Old things have passed away. All things have become new. So that's really the same as it is in the new, the new heavens and the new earth. It's not going to be that God annihilates the heaven and earth and it's just, and we have a brand new creation out of nothing. It's going to be the same old earth, but totally renovated and transformed into something new, like you and I were. Let me just back up. The word passed away, these are the three references we looked at. But the old world is going to be a, a conflagration and a burning up, and it's going to be a new heaven and a new earth. Again, keep your bookmark in Revelation, but if you, if you go back to the book of Isaiah, even in the Old Testament, there were prophecies concerning the, the transient nature of this heaven and earth, and the fact that in, in the coming days in prophecy, there is going to be tremendous destruction of this earth and ultimately a new heaven and a new earth created. Isaiah chapter 34, for example, it says this. Isaiah 34, verse 4. It says, All the hosts of heaven shall be dissolved, and the heavens 
shall be rolled up like a scroll. All their hosts shall fall down as a leaf from the vine and as fruit falling from a fig tree. Chapter 51 of Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 51 and verse 6. He says, lift up your eyes to the heavens and look on the earth beneath, for the heavens will vanish away like smoke. The earth will grow old like a garment. And those who dwell in it will die in like manner, but my salvation will be forever and my righteousness will not be abolished. The transient nature of this heaven and earth. And it's interesting, the, the phrases he uses here about the heavens will vanish away like smoke. <laughs> Something happens to the, to the atmosphere and the earth will grow old like a garment. And their garments weren't polyester or fire hose canvas like we got today. And their old garments disintegrated when they grew old. They just came apart, which is a perfect description of what John says in Revelation. He uses the word uh, luo uh, to, to, to just come apart. And uh, So anyways, they had the same. Uh, Revel, uh, Isaiah chapter 66 Again, talks about the new heaven and new earth. Chapter 66 and verse 22. For the new heavens and the new earth which I make shall remain before me, says the Lord. So shall your descendants and your name remain. That is what the God of the Jews do. God's going to make a new heaven and a new earth. Chapter 65, let's go back one chapter. Verse 17. Chapter 65 and verse 17. For behold, I create new heavens and a new earth, and the former shall not be remembered or come to mind. But be glad and rejoice forever in what I create. For behold, I create Jerusalem as a rejoicing, and her people in joy. I will rejoice in Jerusalem, joy in my people. The voice of weeping shall no longer be heard in her, nor the voice of crying. Why? The curse is gone. We've got a new heaven and a new earth. So, uh, even the old prophecies in the Old Testament, uh, told us about the passing away of the former way of life and the curse is gone. Our soul underwent a transformation when we were born again. John chapter 3, Jesus says, no one enters the kingdom of heaven. You must be born again. Born from above. The Spirit of God does a work in, in this. When we're saved, the Spirit of God comes upon us and gives us new birth. We're born from above. And, and, and we're made alive spiritually. So our souls are regenerated. It's called regeneration. Uh, that's the work of the Holy Spirit. Born again. That's where the word comes from. And our bodies are going to be made anew also, aren't they? And they're either with the rapture or the resurrection of our bodies from the grave. Uh, 1 Corinthians 15 says that, uh, uh, that these bodies are going to be changed. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment, a twinkling of an eye, the last trump, the dead Christ shall be rise, and we shall be caught up, and, and, and but we're going to be changed, transformed, our bodies. First uh, John chapter 3 tells us that uh, we don't know what we're going to be like, but we, we're going to be like him, for we shall see him as he is. So, so there's going to be a transformation of these bodies. First Corinthians talks about our bodies. That which is sown in the ground is a fleshly mortal body is going to be raised incorruptible and put on immortality and fit for eternity. And so our bodies will be glorified. Again, there's continuity. It's going to be my body that was put in the ground in the grave. It's going to be resurrected. But it's going to be transformed into a new, eternal, glorified body fit for eternal habitation. So my soul has been reborn rejuvenated, reconstituted, if you will, when I was saved. My body is going to be reconstituted, made new at the resurrection. And then our eternal dwelling place is renewed. That's what we're talking about here back in Revelation chapter 21. Uh, the new heaven and the new earth. That's our eternal dwelling place. Let's go back to Revelation 21. I asked you to put a bookmark there. My bookmark ended up in my concordance in the back. <laughs> Anyways, Revelation chapter 21. This new heaven, the new earth passed away. The fact that this is going to be a transformation of the old into something akin to the original creation. Remember, there was nothing wrong with the original creation, was there? God created it. Heaven, earth, Everything, man, and when he was done creation, what did he say about it? Very good. 
In other words, it's exactly what God wanted. Perfect. Until sin entered. And so the transformation is not with what God had originally created in man or earth, but the sin, the curse, the whole order that's been affected by that is going to be reverse transformed, changed. And so I believe that our eternal heaven and earth, where we're going to exist for eternity, is not some ghostly, ethereal, mystical cloud in space. We're not going to be sitting on clouds as little vapors or something. We are going to dwell for eternity on a literal new heaven and new earth, something akin to the original garden of paradise, only better, because it will never have anything in, uh, about sin again. And our bodies will also be resurrected and fit for habitation on this earth, this new heaven and new earth, in which only dwells righteousness. So this study gives us a little idea of, of uh, what heaven is going to be like. It is going to be an actual heaven and earth, perfect. And uh, maybe even some ideas of what we will be doing in eternity. Verse 2. Oh, one more thought. Romans chapter 8. We don't have time to turn there, but Romans chapter 8. Paul says that uh, the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared to the glory that shall be revealed right, in the future. And then he talks about earth. This earth, creation itself, groans and travails in pain together till now. What? Creation. That's distinct in the, in the context there. You make it a distinction between we believers who are groaning, waiting for our bodies to be renewed. This whole creation, the earth, the trees, the creation that is under the curse is also groaning, waiting to be released from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. Again, that's a reference, I think, to the new heaven and new earth, in which the earth, the present earth, is under the bondage of corruption, the curse of sin. And it will also be released from that into the glorious liberty of the children of God. It's going to be a glorious thing. Well, verse 2 says this, Then I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. Isn't that interesting? The holy city, the new Jerusalem, and remember what I said about how big it was last week? It was uh, 1,380 miles cubed, um, or up to 1,500, depending on our translation of the ancient measurements. But... That's a picture of the cube that Carl made for me sitting on the United States. It's huge and it extends up into the atmosphere on well, 1,380 miles. Um, so it is a massive city. This holy city, New Jerusalem. And it comes down from heaven. Um, and, and I assume that that's from the celestial heaven, the abode of God. It comes down and then sets on this new heaven and new earth. Um, as a bride adorned for her husband, the holy city, the new Jerusalem, prepared, in other words, God has prepared, God has made this city, this place of our eternal abode, as a bride adorned for her husband. This is going to be a place of beauty. We studied a little bit about it, the jasper walls, the pearly gates, the translucent gold pavement on the streets. This is going to be just an unbelievable thing. But what's interesting here is that it's the city that is adorned like a bride. And yet it's, it's our habitation. It's the habitation of God's wife, Christ's bride. And what I believe he's talking about here, he's almost blending the beauty of the bride of Christ in the eyes of God with the city itself. In other words, God has made, Christ has gone to prepare a place. God has made this place for us that is so gorgeous, so beautiful, that it's a reflection of who we are in His eyes. His bride, His people, are the love of His life. If I can say that in an appropriate way, the love of His life. We are the apple of His eye. God says it. We are the apple of His eye. We are the most precious, most dearest thing to God. And it just reminds me that sometimes we get heaven a little bit backwards. We think that heaven is all about us. 
aren't we going to enjoy heaven? Yes, we will. God has prepared for us a phenomenal place in all of its glory. But heaven is not primarily about us enjoying it. It's about God enjoying us. We are God's, the love of, we are what God has given his life for. He did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all. How shall he not with him freely give us all things? And all eternity he's going to be lavishing upon us this beauty thing. Because he loves us. He loves us so much. I was going to give a testimony, but you cut me off, Nathan. <laughs> About the love of God in eternity past, before you were ever born, before the foundations of the world. He loved you. And he determined to save you. He chose you. And then in time, he sent his own son to die on Calvary to bear your sin and to pay the debt that you owe so that in time he can draw you to himself and save you and declare you righteous and ultimately bring you to glory to be with him in heaven. Amen. Isn't that phenomenal, his love? And what's ever going to separate you from the love of God? Nothing. Nothing. Romans 8 has got to be one of my favorite passages. And what shall separate you from the love of God? Sometimes we get discouraged. Sometimes because of our own sin and our failures and our stumblings. And maybe we're cut off from fellowship and friendship of our family and friends. And, and things get in the way. But you know, nothing will ever separate us from the love of God. He who loved us in eternity past and has prepared this place for his bride. No sin, no stumbling, no falter of your in this life is ever going to cause him to cease from loving you. He will bring us to glory. Romans 8, he stirs us up. And, and so this heaven is as the bride. It is as glorious. It's adorned as a bride. It's the city, but it's a reflection of you and I and his love for us. We, whom he loves. And you know, it's interesting when the Lord Jesus prayed in John chapter 17. At the end of his prayer, remember John 17 is the, the intercessory prayer of Jesus Christ in the garden before he was crucified. And he says, I pray not for these alone, but for those who will believe on me through their name. And he says, and I pray, our Father, I desire that those whom you have given me be with me where I am, that they may behold my glory. Jesus wants us to be in heaven with him. That's the prayer he made to the Father. John 14, when he told his disciples, I go away. But if I go away, I will come again and receive you unto myself so that where I am, there you may be also. That is the desire of God's heart. That's the plan of God. And so when we get to heaven in eternity, there in that holy, beautiful city, Jesus is going to be glad that we're there because that's the whole plan. It's not just about us being glad that we're there. Jesus, our Father, he will be thrilled with us being there. And we, we can't comprehend the love of God and the grace and mercy of God. Anyways, let's go to 2 Peter quickly. <laughs> Peter also talks about this 2 Peter chapter 3, beginning at verse 4, these scoffers in the last day, which we're seeing today, they say this, where's the promise of his coming? Well, for since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. For this they willingly forget, that by the word of God the heavens were of old, and the earth standing out of water and in the water, by which the world that then existed perished, being flooded with water. They People forget that God did flood this earth globally. Judgment on sin. Verse 7. But the heavens and the earth which are now preserved by the same word. I mean they're held, they are being reserved by the power of God and the word of God. They are reserved for fire until the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. God promised with the rainbow that he'll never again flood this earth, right? And destroy it by water. But it is being reserved for a judgment of fire. So he says in verse 8, Beloved, don't forget this one thing, that the Lord one day is a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day. We, our timing is not God's timing. The Lord, verse 9, is not slack concerning His promise, that is, concerning His return. Simply that He is long-suffering. That is, that's what it says. It's simply that He's long-suffering toward us. Toward us. Who's the us? Well, he wrote it to the elect. Go back to chapter 1. 
to his people. God is long-suffering toward us, not willing that any of us understood in the text should perish, but that all of us understood should come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night. Built. And so when he talks, and, and Paul was not using this term in the scientific, accurate way that a present-day chemist or physicist would maybe use it, but he was using it in a very similar fashion um, that the word elements are used of those little components of which the bigger things are made, like words are made from the little alphabet letters and the elemental sounds, the rudimentary fundamental sounds they make up our language, so also the elements of the world. And so when he says the elements shall be burnt up, shall melt with fervent heat, um, he's talking about this earth somehow is going to be dissolved by fire. Uh, the, the solids are going to be turned to gases, the gases, the oxygen, things are going to be consumed. The heavens and the earth as we know them now are going to be consumed. And it says, and the works that are in it. What are the works? These are the works of man, the works of sinful man, of unsaved man. Uh, it's all going to be dissolved and made new. Trees, vegetation, the works of mankind, mechanical, musical, technical, agricultural, educational, political, social, intellectual, digitally, architecturally, horticulturally, medically, economically, everything that is on this earth presently. Cities, towns, building, houses, furniture, utensils, instruments of arts, music, everything of all kinds will be burnt by a literal fire. It says it will melt with a fervent heat. The fervent heat. The word there is a medical term and it means feverish, burning up with a fever. You put your hand on your child's forehead and go, oh my, you're burning up with a fever. Well, the, mer the, the word means an internal fire. It's interesting, isn't it? If God is going to burn up this world with the fire, what is this world? In? What's inside this earth anyways, isn't it? A molten fire? What's a volcano? When it cracks open and, and we have some of this molten stuff coming up. It's not... Remember how, how God flooded the earth globally in Noah's day? He not only rained down the canopy of water from above, but he also broke up the deep places from beneath and the waters came from up above and from below and flooded this earth. And it's not unusual or not even uh, surprising to see that God just by the mere command would not only have the eruptions of the volcanoes, so fire coming up from beneath, but the raining of meteors and lightning, etc., from above to, total, to turn this whole earth into a uh, massive global inferno burning up everything. And uh, that's what it says, the works. Um, John tells us, 1 John chapter 2 says, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. And then the next verse he says, What's in this world is going to pass away. Right? Uh, in 1 Corinthians, Paul says that the fashion of this world will pass away. The fashion of it, the form, the appearance of it, the external things are going to pass away. They're going to be burned up. Everything that mankind presently lives for, strives for, earns, saves, builds, works with, is going to be gone. So what should we be living for? Not those things. We laying up for ourselves treasures in heaven. So what? So what? Well, you know what? God does tell us the so what. Notice in verse 11, the so what is the therefore. Since all these things will be dissolved, since all this earth, since all these material things and everything that man strives for, lives for, and his whole life is based on, is going to be dissolved, melt, vanish, consumed, come unglued, undone, whatever you want, whatever word you want to use there, how should we live? And it tells us that. What manner of persons ought you to be? in holy conduct and godliness. <clears throat> Our God is a consuming fire. And the day of judgment is coming in which this world and all of its works will be burned up. 
you'd be wise to be laying up for yourselves treasures in heaven and whatever God has given you in this life, that you'd be using it to serve Him in righteousness and godliness. And the second thing here, he says, looking for and hastening the coming day of God. Eagerly awaiting, looking for, having your eyes heavenward, forward looking. This life is not, it's not going to matter. 20 years, 50 years, 100 years from now, nobody in this room is going to care a bit about what you did in this life with all your material goods. It's only going to be matter what you did for Christ. That's all that's going to matter. What was your relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ? Did you serve Him faithfully? Because we're going to have an eternity. And we ought to be prepared, looking for and hastening the coming day of God. Because of which the heavens will be dissolved, being on fire, and the elements will melt with fervent heat. Nevertheless, we, according to His promise, look eagerly away with our faces toward, tros, toward, Awaiting, looking, anticipating, prepared. It's interesting that Peter uses it. The day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night. This day of the Lord will come unexpectedly. In Luke chapter 12, our Lord gave a parable and he talked about the servants who were prepared, some who weren't prepared. And Jesus said, had the master of the house known in what day the thief would come, they would have been prepared. That's the gist of that parable. Be prepared for when the Master returns. And so Peter, being there present, he's taking and making an application of our Lord's parable right here. And he says, the day of the Lord is coming. You better be prepared. You better be so living that when He comes, you'll be, I'm glad you're here, Lord. I've been living for you. I've been looking for, and I've been hastening, eagerly awaiting your return. And you know what else? Serving and witnessing. If you go back to chapter 3, earlier in that chapter, where it says in verse 9, the Lord is not slack concerning His promise. Uh, it's been 2,000 years, it'll be longer before He comes. We don't know when. This earth hasn't been destroyed by fire yet, and we can see no cataclysmic judgments from God. But believe me, friends, He's not slack concerning His promise. He will fulfill His promise of His coming. The reason he is delaying this catechismic day, the day of the Lord, is still waiting, is why? Because he's long-suffering toward his elect, not willing that any of them should perish, but that they all should come to repentance. The Lord is presently withholding the day of the Lord, the day of Christ, the day of judgment, this catechismic day of, of total wiping out this whole earth and and transforming it into a new heaven and earth. Why? He's waiting until his last chosen child is saved. If God is holding up the climax of world and universal history so that he can make sure that every last one whom the Father has given to him comes to repentance, what do you suppose we ought to be doing in this meanwhile? If that's what God is waiting for, for this great day, which will bring world history to a climax and begin eternity. If God the Father is waiting, long-suffering, patiently, drawing men to Himself, saving them with the everlasting gospel, what do you suppose we ought to be doing? I ask you, what's on your plate that makes you so busy that you can't be occupied with witnessing for the Savior? What is it in your daily schedule that makes you so busy that you don't have time to be a fisher of men? To share the gospel of Christ, the everlasting gospel of people. God has commissioned us. I know He's busy bringing souls to Himself and drawing them, but God has commissioned us as the ministers of righteousness and the ministers of reconciliation. 2 Corinthians 5. We are ambassadors for God. It is our responsible to beseech people, beg people to be reconciled with God. How do you know that one that you might witness to and bring to Christ might not be the last one God is waiting for before He brings in this great day? What is it on your plate that keeps you so busy 
that you don't have time for that which is of eternal matters to God. Global, international, <laughs> all of world history is waiting for the last elect child of God to be saved. And here we are running around <laughs> caring less oftentimes. God told us to be fishers of men. Go back to Romans chapter 10 in closing here. Last couple of verses. Chapter 10 and verse 14. Romans 10, 14. How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? God has given the responsibility of ministry, of evangelism and missions into the hands of his people. Yes, God can do it supernaturally. But he's chosen to work through human means. That's us. It's interesting that this comes back in chapter 6 and 7. We see the, the effective ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ. Chapter 8, we see the regenerating work of the power of the Holy Spirit. Chapter 9, we see the electing grace of God the Father choosing, sovereignly choosing people to be saved. But you know what? Then he gets to chapter 10. And he says, you know what? They can't hear. <laughs> they can't hear about this great salvation unless someone tells them. So what manner of persons ought we ought to be? Holy and godly conduct. Busily prepared, looking for and awaiting the return of our Lord. And third, witnessing, sharing the everlasting gospel of Christ with the unsaved. That's so long. Heavenly Father, what a great day is coming. We have no idea. And we don't have any idea of when. But we do know that the day of the Lord will come. The Lord, you, our Savior, not slack concerning your promise. We want to be found prepared. We want to be found as one of your true children in Christ, a new creation. We want to be found busy serving and witnessing fishers of men until you come for us. We just pray, maybe even, Father, there's someone here this morning who's not a genuine Christian. Maybe, as we talked about uh, <coughs> the sign of a new Christian, of being new. Old things have passed away, and hold all things have become new. And they, and they can look at their life and say, you know what, I'm still the old person I ever was. Even though I went to church, or even though I was baptized, I, I'm still the old person. And they're still in need of their spirit being renewed and being transformed by the power of God. And so, our Father, we just would pray for their salvation. We pray that they would uh, cast themselves upon the mercy of God. They would call out on the Lord Jesus Christ. And we know that your promise is that those who call upon the Lord Jesus Christ shall be saved. So we just pray for their genuine salvation today. And Father, help us to live for your glory. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Hymn number 250 in your hymn books, God's Final Call, was actually the song I had picked out if I were preaching on hell, but I think it's appropriate anyways. God's Final Call. Let's stand as we say.
faithful for you in all the things that we do throughout this week. Mm -hmm. That we would stand courageous without fear to say that we are Christians, that we trust and that we have our faith in you, that we have high hopes and expectations. We know by your name <coughs> that you are coming again faithful to your word. We give you thanks, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you.